Aaron Burr's daughter, Theodosia, was shipwrecked off the North Carolina coast in about 1812. And uh, she may have been taken in by Outer Banks residents or killed by pirates or probably just lost at sea. And that part's fact, but there's great fiction, thanks to Michael Parker's new book, The Watery Part of the World, and he'll be here to tell us all about the fact and the fiction on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. My guest is Michael Parker, who's the author of a new book, The Watery Part of the World. Michael Parker, welcome. Thank you, thanks for asking Well, me. we're excited about having you here. You, of course, grew up in North Carolina, mostly in some of North Carolina's small towns. I think you've always had a love affair with the North Carolina coast. Right now you're teaching, writing at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, but you're returning to the North Carolina coast for your latest novel, The Watery Part of the World. Now, uh, I'm interested in Theodosia Burr, the daughter of the Vice President of the United States and mm -hmm. the legends that developed around her disappearance off the North Carolina coast. Uh, but uh, Remind us about the facts and then tell us how she became a character in your book. Okay. We don't, I mean, there's not that much that's known about her um, because she only lived until she was 20. Um, we do know that she was raised by her father to be the best educated woman in the, in the United States of America. Her education was very progressive. He taught her Greek, he taught her Latin, um, physics, all these things that were at the time reserved for men. You know, women were educated in a very different way. Um, and um, the, the one exception was that he did not, because his grandfather was Jonathan Edwards, the great minister, uh, he did not um, push any kind of religious instruction upon her at all. Um, so, so you was one of these uh, sort of preacher's kids or grandkids who moved a little bit away from the uh, fire and brimstone exactly. of the, of the, uh, and, or the was he uh, Aaron Burr's father or grandfather? It's his grandfather. grandfather. Yeah, and he was a particularly fiery and brimstone-y preacher, as you, as you know from re reading his sermons. And I think it was a reaction against that, and also just um, ideas of, of a kind of the Enlightenment and the European way of, of educating people. And he read Mary Wollstonecraft, who of course was so instrumental in, um, in um, progressively educating women. Um, so we know she was very educated, she was very dedicated to her father. She married the governor of South Carolina, Joseph Wollstone, and went down and lived in Charleston. Um, her father, after the duel, uh, there, you had to remind people of the duel with uh, with Alexander mm -hmm. Hamilton, right? Yeah. He's more famous for having killed Alexander Hamilton than for being vice president of the United States and maybe a um, uh, flirting with uh, with with uh, a conspiracy against the United States. I right? Guess. Yeah. Well, he he tried to take over Mexico and proclaim himself the emperor. He had a lot of grandiose ideas, you know. But that's not uncommon for politicians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's sometimes you know a, a kind of um, ambition that is accompanied by um, a little bit of a delusional streak. Uh, have we ever seen that before? Well, I've experienced some of it before. Yeah, but let's not see, get into you that. Know, <laughs> you know, we'll stay away from it. But I mean, in his he was really just a fascinating man, and I knew very little. About about him except for the duel until I started reading, reading you know, biographies about him in order to write this book about his daughter. Well, his daughter is shipwrecked, uh, going to visit her father, mm -hmm. uh, but lost on the North Carolina coast and we mm -hmm. hadn't heard anything for sure about her since. How does she, how do you make her a character in this, uh, in your latest novel? How well, first of all, you know, for a fiction writer, a disappearance someone who just disappears into thin air is like the greatest thing ever. You know, I <laughs> you mean, can do with her what you want. Yeah, it's like so many writers have been drawn to the lost colony. I don't think there's ever been a very good book written about it or um, a you know, novel, but I mean, I've heard so many writers talk about it 
as potential material because it's a, it's sort of the er story of you know people who arrived in this country and then just disappeared or sort of swallowed up. So her story is the same. I mean, you can do whatever you want to with what it. What did you do with it? Tell us about okay, uh, the, uh, did, did, is she Theodosia? In Theodosia, the, yes. Um, in, the, in the book? In the book, yes. Um, and it's very clear that, that, that I mean, I, I incorporated a whole lot of her early autobiographical details. Um, her devotion to her father, her education, her marriage to Joseph Alston. Um, then when she hit the island and I, I threw in the pirates, because who can resist pirates? You know, I mean, the well, pirates. No, what, what, don't tease us. What, did, what, 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 what about these pirates? Well, what these they do? pirates. The, in my version, she was overtaken. The, her ship was overtaken by pirates. Um, she was. These um, are special outer banker pirates. They're not uh, seaborne pirates, is it? Is mm, there, yeah. There, well, there? That, what I mean, what happened in the outer banks, um, which a, a lot of you probably know from the title of, of Nags Head, is that. Um, the pirates would tie um, a light, a lantern, to the head of a, of a horse and parade it up and down so that the ships would think that that was a light, right, and they would sail toward it. And then, um, what is it called, Diamond Shoals, the battleground I mean, of the Atlantic uh -huh. there, the, the graveyard of the Atlantic. Right. So many of those ships washed up there. right? And then the pirates would go out, and a lot of times they weren't even technically pirates, they were just people earning their living, that was the way they earned their living, right? They just, fair, I mean, technically, I guess they were pirates, but they ferried out and took whatever was on the boat, killed whoever was on the boat often, and and came back. So but it wasn't our, our, legend, uh, our legend about the Outer Bankers and the uh, shipwrecks off Diamond Shoals and the collection of the results of the shipwreck, it's, it's a benign, type memory in which the outer bankers say, uh, and when they say their prayers, please don't let there be any shipwrecks, but if there are some shipwrecks, let them be here. Yeah, uh, But right. it, no, nothing like murderers and exploiter and and, and causing shipwrecks. Yes, I, you, and you're absolutely right to point that out, and I, I should say that I'm conflating a lot of myths, <laughs> right? It's not just specific so, to the outer banks, you know? I mean, I even, when, I'm, when I was writing this, I was thinking about Somalia. I mean, I'm a fiction writer. I don't really have to hold to what to historical accuracy in this case because I'm making it up. So I wanted well, to make it interesting. One of your pirates, an outer banker who is uh, a mean guy mm -hmm. named Daniels, right, uh, is, is is becomes for a moment a leading character, even though it's momentary. Mm -hmm. uh, what does he? How do he and Theodosia get along? Well, he. What Theodosia does is um, when she's captured. By when the she's pirates. captured, right? She feigns insanity, um, and he, even though he's ruthless, um, respects that to be. He, he says he's going to spare her because he thinks she's touched by God. Um, he's kind of a godless man, but on the other hand, he knows that you know because she's. Um, in that condition that he can't really, he can't, he can't bring himself to do what he would to someone who wasn't, who didn't come across as insane. So instead, he brings her on the island and just sort of places her in the care of, of the people that he, um, can, that the whole population of the island whom he controls. This is in the early 1800s, about 1812, 13, 14, and you give us a hint about how, or you give us a report about how she makes her way and become sort of a permanent resident of the Outer Banks. And then you take us um, to close to modern times. Right. And how do you relate, uh, to tell us how you bring Theodosia, the Theodosia story mm -hmm. into something that's uh, closer to our own times. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, um, Theodosia is taken in by one particular person whose name is Whaley. And um, he kind of takes care of her and they end up eventually marrying um, and having some children who then turn out to be the descendants, the, the ancestors of the people in the more contemporary part of the story. So it's really two stories that I put together. I had written a story about the last three people living on an island in North Carolina, and I had published it as a short story, and it was about two old women and one older black man um, who lived on this island that was buffeted by hurricanes and storms and bugs and, and um, all the, everyone else on the island left and that left the three of them 
and they were getting older and so the decision was what how are we going to are we going to stay or are we going to go what what's going to happen to us so then these two stories i put together because i'd written this other part about theodosia which really wasn't happening i, I couldn't get the <laughs> language right i couldn't get you know i mean i couldn't figure out how to make it work it read like um the worst kind of historical fiction right i mean very leaden prose and the dialogue well, was you bad sure livened it up <laughs> Well, maybe the pirates help. The pirates you know? always help. Yeah, I mean, just just let a little pirate in, and, and well, this is um, <clears throat> you know this is really interesting to me. And so, the, the as far as historical fiction is concerned, the I'm going to call it modern. It's close to being modern. Part mm -hmm. of it is all is also based on a few historical facts. Right. And so, w tell us the facts that you that inspired you to write this story about the three people the last residents of an island that used to be populated with a with a you know a, a strong working town really that's all i knew i mean that's all i knew well, you is tell us about the island what in the time period well i can, can tell you remember? about i mean <laughs> I, I can tell you that it's based on portsmouth island mm -hmm. which i never mention in the book because i don't want people to say Oh, Portsmouth Island is not like that. The church is over here, and the post office is over here, and and those three. It's people not were Portsmouth Island, but it's inspired by. It's inspired a story. by and Portsmouth. And what was the real Portsmouth Island story as you remember it? As I remember it, it, you know, there were three people left because of all the storms, and the and those three people were two elderly white women who were not sisters. I made them sisters in the novel, and an older black man who actually, in fact, took care of them. And there was still, you know, even after all these years. Um, and just three people left on the island, a kind of racial hierarchy, right, obviously, so that he was subservient to these women, as I understood it, as the story was told to me. Um, but, you know, as a novelist, y you hear these things and you don't want to ask too many questions. I mean, I'm not... You didn't want to be bound up by the real story. You wanted to be unleashed by yeah, that I story. Yeah, I want to make... My job is to make stuff up. So I didn't, you know, pry. I didn't prod. I didn't say, well, how, what was this man like and what was their relationship like? And I'm sure that, you know, my version of it is wildly different from whatever happened. Well, I think uh, maybe the most interesting part of your book are these characters, these three characters. Mm -hmm. There are other characters who are also interesting. But uh, since we've just got a limited amount of time, I, wanna, I want you, if you will, to just give us a character sketch of these three people mm -hmm. who are the last fictional survivors in this fictional island okay. off the North Carolina coast. Okay. As I said, there are two sisters. The, the younger one is named um, Maggie, and she's a bit of a romantic and a bit of a mess. You know, I mean, she, she falls for this guy, a fisherman who comes over who's 15, 20 years younger than her, and this happens early on in the novel. Um, he really wants her to leave the island because he feels that she's so bound by the conventions of living there and by the stricture of living with her older sister and by the past um, that they would never be able to fully you know have a, a good relationship if they stayed on an island so he he wants her to go off island and finally she she can't she 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 stays she is so fascinating for many reasons one of which is she's say 40 this young man's closer to 20 than right. that and uh, yet she is the little she's still the little girl she mm -hmm. still, as he said, uh, is, it, help me if I get this wrong, but he, when he first meets her, he says, I hear you're hot or, <laughs> yeah, or something right, right, along right. those yeah, lines. Yeah. That, wild, that, I think. That, that, or, or yeah. Wild, and so she still has this, she's, um, l you know, living in a very small town on an island, but she's got some um, raging hormones yeah. that still, at, at 40, are still guiding her life. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's un. That's unlikely. <laughs> that doesn't seem unlikely. You know, yeah. I mean, people keep you know keep on doing what they're doing until they can anymore. But she, yeah, she definitely is quite randy and has a reputation on the island. Her older sister is the complete opposite. She's very buttoned down. She's very. Um, she feels that it is her job in life to um, perpetuate uh, what she feels is the truth of the island which is just as much, much myth, obviously, as any, um, or anyone else's version of the island, but to her... It's She's the local keeper of history and it, myth right. of, of this exactly. place. The and local she, historian, yeah. I mean, she's interested in preserving the kind of um, facts about the Outer Banks, which we, which we know about the accent, 
you know, about the, the recipes and the, and the kind of stories of survival that we've all read and, and that have been cataloged by oral historians. Now, are you sort of making fun of the outer bankers who are attached to their myths and their history? No, not way? at all. I'm more, I'm not, I don't think I'm making fun of anyone, but if I, but if I am, <laughs> I'm making fun of myself in a sense, <laughs> you know, as an as as an author who's coming in there and trying to understand the culture that is, that is many cultures, right, and trying to um, consolidate the whole history of the Outer Banks into this one story that fits neatly into my understanding of what history is. That's what the book finally is about. That. Everyone on that island has a story that they're not telling because they're not allowed to tell it. Well, well, uh, I want to talk some more about both of these women, but mm -hmm. uh, another interesting and very hard to get into character in your book mm -hmm. is Woodrow, who's the African American, mm -hmm. what uh, the third last survivor of this uh, living on this island, mm -hmm. who's a complicated person in the relationship among those three people is kind of complicated. Yeah, tell us about Woodrow. Well, Woodrow, I think, is really in some sense the most developed character. I'm not sure what you mean by harder to get into. Well, maybe it's because he's the most developed, but he's subtly most yeah, developed. Right, and yeah. it's uh, maybe on the first reading you don't pick up on every piece of Woodrow. I'm not criticizing no, you. No, 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 no. Did you, you can criticize me. It's your, <laughs> no, I wouldn't it's your do show. It. <laughs> um, I think he's, you know, f part of it is the language that I found to tell his story, which is, you know, the syntax is in the idiom. Just tell, first tell us uh, who he is and tell, describe him for us. I'm trying to. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. He's, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, he's, a, he's older. He's a fisherman. He has 11 children. He was married to this woman named Sarah who lost her life in a hurricane. And that's really, st I mean, the, that happens early on in the book. And the rest of the book, he's so, cons I mean, he's so bereaved and and mourning in mourning for her, I think, and it affects his relationships with the island. But yet he doesn't want to leave the island necessarily um, because he's so wedded to what it was when they were there and she wanted him to leave the island and he did for long periods of time but he kept coming back because that was the place that he knew. Well, it, it, I mean this like many, like much modern fiction particularly by southern writers, race is, a, is, is spun all the way through the story. Right. Uh, subtly. Mm -hmm. and did you, how did you approach weaving race into this story of these three survivors? Well, with much trepidation, because you know I'm a middle-aged white man writing from the point of view of a, an older black man, and um, I mean that's always a tricky pop proposition. I mean, I, you know, I think the the trick there is to honor the um, integrity and the complexity of the character, um, and I think too many white writers, when they're writing black characters, make them too good. They don't make them credible because they 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 are scared um, to to make them and to any way make give them faults, which is a disservice because you know it then suggests that these people are not really people. So you know, I mean, it, it, it I had to think long and hard about how to do that. But I've never written um, you know about race. I mean, all my stuff has been set in Eastern North Carolina, and very very few of the stories that I've written are really directly about race. Well, so this one for me is uh, big time race in mm -hmm. the sense that you got three, your three surviving characters, two whites and one African American, mm -hmm. they're all by themselves. And the caste system that's a legacy of our uh, history mm -hmm. is retained in a quiet way and you keep thinking unnecessarily. They, right. they, they, but it, it's there and it, it, it works to enrich and to uh, r enrich the story and raise questions about who we are, all, yeah. all of us. All right. Well, that was what I mean when I first heard the story about these three people, you know, left two white people and one white person. I, you know, the, my, or one black person. Yeah, yeah one black person. My immediate reaction was, well, why does he live off on his side of the island? You know, I mean, what if there's only three people? Can't we figure out a way for it to be e <laughs> a, you know, a little more equal? I mean, that was sort. Of, but you know, you have to consider the time and the place and the culture and you know. Um, who he is and when he was born and where, how they were and how they were born. And there, I think the book does, um, the characters try in their own way to bridge the gap. I mean, a terrible thing happens, which I right. won't, won't Yeah, no, I'm not going to push you. It, a terrible thing does happen, and it, uh, it's terrible, but it 
seasons, all of the things that you and I have been talking about. Exactly, right. I want to move, if I can, because we're running out of time. The, okay. the, the, another, uh, something that you introduced that um, sort of comes out of the blue mm -hmm. are, are important characters, like a Greek chorus they come. These are the people who come from the research triangle somewhere, either from Carolina or state or mm -hmm. someplace like that, because they want to record, get on tape, these memories of these last survivors. Mm -hmm. And you, um, who, who are, you call them the tape recorders. You right. don't even let them use their names. You just, they're the tape recorders. Well, that's what Henry, I mean, that's what Woodrow, originally his name was Henry, that's what Woodrow calls them. I mean, they're anthropologists, essentially. They're oral historians, you know. I have complete respect for their, for what they do. Um, on the other hand, I'm, you know, there's a sense, um, that oral history is more authentic and honest than written history, and I think that's definitely true, right? If you have one person writing the history of a place, then that is of more um, value than, you know, individually these voices telling what, what their lives were like. But on the other hand, I think a lot of times what happens is oral historians ask questions in such a way that they elicit answers that they already knew. I mean, they're, they're trying, they're fishing for, you know, their vision of a place to be ratified and they have a lot of power in the questions they ask and in the way they ask the questions just like you do, <laughs> right? I mean, you're an oral historian. I don't, but I'm, unfortunately, I can't control your answers. I, <laughs> That's and, true because I won't let you, but, <laughs> but I mean, you, do, you, you see what I mean? No, I, mean, I do. They have a lot mean. of power. And I think uh, one of the things that you do very quietly in this book, and it's fiction and mm -hmm. it's not meant to be, take any particular, make any strong points, but what you do is you raise a suspicion in me and in every one of your readers, well, hey, maybe oral history is not as authoritative as we make it out to be. It is subject, just like every other kind of history, to who's telling it right. and who's asking it and who's doing the research and mm -hmm. where they go to do the research. Exactly. That's exactly what I meant. And if anything, I said earlier I was sort of making fun of myself. I mean, I guess my role, in a way, is as novelist, is as an oral, a sort of oral historian who is isolating these different voices and, and getting them to tell their stories, but also aware that there is a story beneath the story, that there are many stories that are beneath the stories, that, that any of these you know, moments in these people's lives could be selected and distributed in ways that would open up a whole different version of what happened on that island and what it was like to live there. And then there's the island itself, which is, you know, shifting away. I mean, th their lives, the, w the way they understand their past is shifting just like the island. Well, I could talk about this book all day. It's just rich and full of all kinds of topics. And as I, um, every time I look over it, I've got more questions, so you'll, you Thanks. might have to come back. Okay. But, but you teach writing. Yes. And before we stop, uh, tell us just in a word or two, how do you, how do you teach great writing? <laughs> How do you how do you how do you make a great writer? Well, I um, I don't set out to make a great writer. I set out to make a great reader, really, uh. someone who reads really well and carefully and and the right sort of stuff, who can then um, take what they read and apply it to their work in a way that is um, of use to them technically and, and thematically. Um, so I don't think you can, you know, I, I can't just sit up there and say, do this, do that. I, I can read a book with them, you know, I can, I can read Moby Dick with my students and say, this is why this book is wonderful, and this is where I, I myself stole from this book. The title of this book <laughs> comes from the second line of Moby oh, well, Dick. Well, well, well. So. Well, as you, as you, let me think, let me put the question to you this way. Maybe I think of a great football coach as someone not who just teaches, but someone who can early on identify the potential talents mm -hmm. of a writer. And I mm -hmm. wonder when you, when, when a class gathers and you get your first paper, do you know right away that this, the, the, those who've got potential and those who uh, might, but probably don't have potential? Yes, I do, but I mean, potential is not actually what makes a writer. Finally, it's, the, it's perspiration and determination and uh, perseverance. I mean, I've seen a lot of students who I thought were way more talented than I, than I am, and they did not go on because they weren't hungry enough, and they weren't willing to put in the time and the effort it takes to revise and rewrite. A and football coach would I'd be able, I think, to ask the question better. What, do, what a football coach does with someone with great potential and the drills and the coaching and the, 
what does the writing coach or the writing teacher do with someone who's got potential both to uh, bring out the, 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 the skills, the potential skills, but also to infuse them with that spirit of determination and drive? Well, I think the analogy is just a little bit faulty because the football coach has them every day, and he can make them he, may, he can make them come out and work them, you know, work through them every day. I don't. I mean, they have to want to get better. They have to want it. And the writers are a little bit less driven. Is well, that... some of them are. I mean, you know, some of them are wildly talented, but just lack the drive and the determination well. to do it. And if that's the case, I can't. You know, you can't make someone feel what they can't feel. Well. Well, uh, thank goodness somebody got hold of you and made you well, the great writer that you are. Thank and you. Uh, for this wonderful, imaginative book, The Watery Part of the World, Michael Parker, uh, it's just been a treat to thank spend this you time so with much, you. Thank you so much, Well, we thank Michael Parker, the author of The Watery Part of the World. We also thank you for joining us and hope that you'll be with us again same time next week when I'll introduce you to another one of North Carolina's great writers. See you then. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council.